Whole Foods Market and other organic retailers are being accused of caving in to manufacturers of genetically modified crops and helping them legitimize their products with consumers. The products are also known as GMOs or genetically modified organisms. In a moment, special two-hour report with GMO expert Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey Smith. Jeffrey, the whole food story, how legit is that one? Well, it's mixed, I think. I think that, first of all, Whole Foods has been a leader in putting their own products through a third-party verified system for making non-GMO claims. It's called the Non-GMO Project. All of their own products have been put through, so in that sense, it's been very, very good. They still continue to sell products that contain GMOs from other manufacturers, and they haven't been really educating consumers about the health risks, which is what we've asked them to do. So it's a kind of a mixed report. I don't think it's as bad as, as what's been circulating on the Internet. And uh, I've, I've got uh, contacts with many of their executives. I think it's a mixed bag within that organization. Uh, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hold their feet to the fire as being uh, uh, equivalent to caving into Monsanto, etc. Okay, and, and as a company that really specializes in organic foods, why would they even let some GMOs in there? Well, right now, if you go to a normal grocery store, uh, about 70% or more of the foods are genetically modified. 70%, Jeffrey? Yeah, and that's not, I mean, it's basically because of the processed foods. Most of the processed foods, maybe 90% or 80 to 90%, have a, at least a small amount of the derivatives of soy or corn or canola oil or cottonseed oil or sugar from sugar beets. Those are the main genetically modified crops that are present in most processed foods. I see. So if you were to remove all GM foods from your store, you would have basically uh, big gaping holes in some of the brands that consumers are aware and are, have been using all their lives. So what we want to do is educate consumers so that their demand is for non-GMO, so that not only Whole Foods but all of the supermarkets out there realize that they have to switch to non-GM, and all of the manufacturers will realize using GM ingredients is a marketing liability. In fact, that's exactly what happened in Europe, George, to get rid of GMOs over there. It was the food companies, not the government that kicked it out of the food supply. Speaking of Europe, there was a Internet email circulating all over the country uh, this week, Jeffrey, that said that the, the U.K. had kicked out Monsanto's crops, GMO crops, and that's a story that, one, didn't happen, and it's about eight years old. Yes, I know. I was aware of that. But what, what the good news was that BASF, which is a biotech company, did decide to pull out of Europe completely and move its headquarters to the United States. And so that does represent a big retreat from the food, from the biotech industry, realizing that they have failed to convince consumers there that GMOs are safe. In addition, France has said, in spite of the fact that a court has ruled that their ban against Monsanto's genetically modified toxic-laden corn is illegal, they said they're still going to maintain a ban on it, and they're thumb their nose at the courts, and that's another example of the strength of the anti-GMO movement in Europe. By the end of the, the couple hours that you're on with me tonight, Jeffrey, we're going to have a better understanding of GMO crops, what we can do about it, how we can watch for it, and uh, just what's happening in that arena. You are working on a new film to educate people. Tell me about it. Well, what we've done in the past is refer to a lot of the health dangers of GMOs based on the animal feeding studies, which are significant. There's damage to virtually every organ and every system studied. We refer to some of the livestock problems. But what we're doing now in this film is pointing out actual experiences from doctors working with patients saying that they're seeing a whole rise of new diseases specifically because of GMOs, and when they take the, the patients off of GMOs, they get better. Same thing with veterinarians and animals. And so we're actually shift. We're, this is actually raising the alarm much more than before because, you know, we talk about a potential threat based on the animal feeding studies, but when we talk about actual irritable bowel syndrome and this thing and that thing and immune system and problems, going away in people that switch to non-GMO diets and you see them and you see their doctors talking about it, it gives a sense of really 
that the specter of GMOs, what they've done to our population since being introduced in the mid-90s, may be that they're, they're largely responsible for the dramatic increase in a whole host of diseases. Well, there's no question. I think if we create healthier diets and do some exercise, you begin to feel better. You begin to change. Uh, what I don't know, Jeffrey, is how do we realize that the foods we eat, the bad foods, are the ones that are contributing to whatever illness or ailment or feeling of melancholy that we might have? You know, it's a great question, and I went to a doctor's office where she prescribed non-GMO diets to every patient, and the, and the whole host of symptoms uh, started to be relieved or actually were quickly relieved in these, in these patients. And we, we realized that they weren't just avoiding GMOs, but they were also switching to organic to make it easier to avoid GMOs. They were also switching to, more, to less processed foods, more whole foods from scratch. And in some cases, they were eliminating dairy and gluten. And so it was confounding to figure out which factor was GMOs. But in the same week that I was doing the study there in, in Chicago, I interviewed several veterinarians, and for them it was much more cut and dry. They took livestock that had been raised and fed on GMOs and switched them to non-GMO, and the only change in the diet and the lifestyle was switching from GM corn and soy to non-GM corn and soy, and the improvement was dramatic. Wow. There was less death rates, less stillborn, um, overall larger litter sizes. In fact, I spoke to two or three different farmers and veterinarians who said, very interestingly, the animals looked healthier and looked happier. They were not agitated. And this is another finding that we're just discovering recently, a kind of a, a universal behavioral defect associated with animals fed GMOs. What is it about the GMOs, in your opinion, that creates this problem? Well, let's take a look at one thing that I'm, I'm discovering. I interviewed a, a scientist last month, and one said that what he's seeing uh, in laboratory animals and uh, livestock animals fed GMOs are the same kind of symptoms as kids with autism. And he gave a presentation just of the physiological, behavioral, and neurological changes in the animals fed GMOs in a German uh, uh, venue. That's recently. frightening. And, and a doctor came up and said, this is exactly what we're seeing with autistic kids. And the, the, the rats that were fed GMOs were getting really agitated and antisocial and becoming cannibalistic. Uh, pigs would wander in their cages like Alzheimer's, couldn't figure out where the feed was, and they'd die or they'd become cannibalistic and attack each other. Um, we've had experiences, uh, we've had reports of even undergraduate students doing studies with mice, showing that the mice were completely agitated and irritated and antisocial. So when they looked deeper into the actual intestines of the animals, George, they found disruptions that were similar to the kind of changes in the gut architecture that are common in autistic kids. Now, I was, given, I was giving a presentation in Marin County recently with two doctors who believe that GMOs were the cause of, of rise of diseases among their patients, and both pointed to gut permeability. This would be holes in the gut. Oh. And, and this could be very serious. It sure could. Now, how do we know, let's say, for example, you buy that big popular brand of soup in a can. Are there genetically modified foods in that? Well, probably. Here's how you can tell. First of all, um, you can go to non-gmoshoppingguide.com, and there we have a list of products that are verified as non-GMO. But not every product that's non-GMO has gone through the verification process. So here's your other tips. One, if it's organic, it's not allowed to intentionally use GMO. Sometimes, of course, contamination occurs, that does happen. but it would be a small amount. Second, it might have a non-GMO label right on the can. And third, you can check the ingredients to see if they are derived from the eight genetically modified food crops that go directly into food. And let's go through those again. Okay. Soy, and that includes soy protein isolate and things like that. A corn. A corn has a lot of offspring, dextrose, maltodextrin. We list them on the shopping guide at nongmoshoppingguide.com. And there's also an iPhone application for free called Shop No GMO. And you can look at those at-risk ingredients and see if it's contained in the ingredients on the ingredient panel. So you have soy and corn. 
You have cottonseed oil, canola oil, sugar. Now, if it doesn't say cane sugar and it just says plain sugar, it includes mostly sugar from sugar beets. Right, the plain white sugar, generally. Yes, All right. exactly. 95% of plain white sugar is from, well, it is 95% of sugar beets are genetically engineered. Well, funny you talk about autism because I'm convinced that an overuse of sugar in children also contributes. So if you're using too much sugar and it happens to be GMO sugar, they're up a creek. Yeah, it's kind of a double whammy. It is. The other uh, GM crops are Hawaiian papaya, most of that, a little bit of zucchini and crookneck squash, um, and alfalfa, which is fed to animals as hay. So those are the major crops. Those are the crops that are genetically engineered that are food crops. There's also some trees here and there and uh, cotton um, for fabric as well. But those are the food crops. So those you have to be aware of. Those you read the labels and you just try to stay away from them. Absolutely. At what point do you think people would start feeling better if they stay off them 100%? You know, based on the experience, well, it's interesting. I, I was just talking to a veterinarian about livestock. We'll get to the people in a second, but I actually have some numbers for the livestock. And he was dealing with a, a farmer in Africa where he's feeding genetically modified corn and just terrible, terrible health problems with his animals, poor production of his dairy cows. And it took, he switched the animals over to non-GM. And within 60 days, the dairy turned around, and uh, 90 days, the productivity improved. And then with the pigs, it was about 120 days before all the symptoms disappeared. But then he ran out of non-GM grain and had to give them genetically modified again, and everything reverted back. And and I assume quickly, too. Yes, it's true. Now, with Hmm. with, um, the doctors that I've interviewed, um, it, it can be... Uh, between like three days and six weeks uh, for most people are finding improvements. And I interviewed several patients, and oftentimes it was much quicker than the six weeks. Uh, One person had irritable bowel syndrome and was told that they'd have to take pills um, every day for the rest of their lives. They said within four weeks they were... um, much, much better. Six weeks, they had to, didn't need pills anymore. I talked to someone within three or four days, skin condition started clearing up. I talked to someone who said after a year of eating non-GMO, she lost 35 pounds, her husband lost 15 pounds, her kids lost 5 pounds each, and the only thing she focused on was removing GMOs from the diet. Um, and we've heard that before. So it really varies, and part of the problem of figuring it out is that there's so many ways, and we'll discover this over the next two hours, there's so many ways that GMOs might be poisoning, poisoning us and causing problems. I mean, new stuff, even stuff that I just got this evening in the last hour, is rather strong evidence for why people should avoid GMOs. Jeez, it's just, this is almost a tragedy, isn't it? You know, it could be a, beyond almost a tragedy. It, it's like... First of all, if you think of the longevity of GMOs, we're, we're feeding them to the, the products of an infant science to the entire population, but it also goes into the environment and affects all living beings, but that's not all. The contaminated gene pool self-propagates through cross-pollination and seed movement, and so we have no technology to fully clean it up. Jeffrey, the crops you just mentioned that are primarily GMOs now, what has happened to the God-given seeds that we once had, that were not GMO seeds. It's not pretty. There's a lot of contamination out there. We, you still can find completely clean, genetic, uh, non-genetically modified corn seeds, non-genetically modified canola seeds, but you really have to look and you really have to weed out the contamination. There was a study done where they, where they bought 33 bags of canola seeds that were supposed to be non-GMO, and 32 of the 33 had at least some small level of contamination. They have contaminated the indigenous corn varieties growing in Mexico. The source of the genetic diversity for the world in corn is now contaminated with GMOs from the United States. In what time period did this all happen? Well, pretty quickly. I was working at a a GMO detection laboratory uh, 12 years ago, and even before I got there, in the late 90s, they had found 60% contamination in corn seed sample bags. So um, it was pretty quick. And, in fact, contamination is really the agenda 
the hidden agenda of the biotech industry and their enforcement wing in Washington. A friend of mine was debating against a senior official at USAID, Agency for International Development in South Africa, on television, and after the uh, TV stopped, they continued to argue, and at one point she got so upset, the AID person, that she admitted in her anger what, she, what her agenda was. She said, you just wait. Soon there will be so much genetically modified corn growing in South Africa, no one in Africa could grow non-GM corn. So it was an example mm. of exactly what they're trying to do. And then in southern, when southern African countries had a famine and we, we were sending um, corn as a food, they discovered it was genetically engineered, and they said to America, please don't send us GMOs. And America said, fine, no way, eat it or starve. And then some countries said, well, at least mill it into flour so that our farmers can't plant it and get the, the fields contaminated. And the U.S. said, no, we're not going to mill it. So it is part of the U.S. agenda, as, as seen in WikiLeaks and others, that they're really marching in lockstep with Monsanto. Worldwide. Worldwide. Okay. One of the main reasons for GMOs, of course, was to create it for Roundup Ready so it would, you know, beat itself up against weeds. Isn't it losing its effectiveness? Isn't Roundup losing its effectiveness against weeds? Precisely. And this is what we all predicted, that when you overuse a weed killer, the weeds develop resistance. That's right. So do bugs. Exactly. And that's what's happening with Monsanto's BT corn, which is corn that's developed, that's built in with an insecticide that breaks open the stomach of insects and kills them. Both the weeds and the bugs are now resisting the very purpose of GMOs. And so you'd think that their days were numbered, but what the biotech industry is doing, it's very interesting. When they introduced Roundup Ready crops, which are crops designed not to die when sprayed with Monsanto's toxic Roundup herbicide, Monsanto said, oh, this will reduce the use of herbicide. Well, they knew that it wouldn't, and in fact it didn't. It's dramatically increased it by 383 million pounds in the first 13 years. So what they're doing now is that now that Roundup is losing its efficiency, companies like um, Dow and Monsanto want to introduce crops that can withstand a component of Agent Orange, 2,4-D. So we're going to have Agent Orange crops and they're known to cause birth defects and other problems. And so the acutely toxic and neurotoxic chemicals are going to be on the rise with huge, huge numbers. And the USDA is saying, we have no problem with this. In fact, there's a comment period right now. So if you go to our site at responsibletechnology.org, you can tell the USDA to stop the promotion and, and acceptance of Agent Orange genetically modified crops. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> It's, it's, it's bizarre. And the thing is, with Roundup, it's interesting. Right now, they have found Roundup in the urine of urban dwellers, in surface water, in groundwater, in 60 to 100 percent of air samples, rain samples, um, water samples. It's found it's practically omnipresent. Now, Monsanto used to claim that it was completely safe and that you can drink it. However, it turns out it's extremely dangerous. It's linked to birth defects. It's linked to endocrine disruption. It can kill placental cells. In fact, it's found to cross the placental barrier. It's found in human blood and in fetal blood. And it turns out that it also reduces the availability of nutrients in crops and in livestock feed. It can disrupt reproductive problems in animals. It can disrupt um, a whole series of chemical processes in, in, in humans. And there's an interesting discovery that's going on right now behind the scenes where they find that Roundup or Roundup Ready crops have a very high concentration of this newly discovered organism, which appears to be linked to reproductive failure and plant diseases. There's a rash, a rash of reproductive failure among livestock in the United States where the animals are not able to maintain their pregnancies. They're having miscarriages or they're just infertile. Well, isn't that happening to humans too, Jeffrey? Exactly. Where there was one fertility clinic in the years ago, now there's 14. So this dramatic increase in infertility in humans may also be linked to these GMOs. Now, 
if you look at some of the laboratory studies on GMOs, you find animals with changed testicles, testicles changing from pink to blue, damage to young sperm cells, uterus and ovary changes. Then they said female rats, genetically modified soy, more than 50% of the babies died within three weeks compared to 10% when the moms were fed non-GM soy. The babies were smaller and sterile. In fact, when the scientist was pressured to stop her research, one of her colleagues tried to comfort her by saying, well, maybe the GM soy will solve the overpopulation problem. Another Russian scientist in the Russian Academy of Science Sciences did a study on hamsters by the third generation. Most lost the ability to have babies. Some had hair growing in their Jeez. mouths. They died at four or five times the rate. I mean, this is really astonishingly high levels of death and, and um, changes in the reproductive organs. Even the government study in Austria showed that when mice were fed Roundup-ready corn, they had fewer babies and smaller babies. How do we know that this Morgellons problem... Uh, which the CDC says is not a problem. How do we know this might not be related to all of this? You know, it's interesting. There was a study done on Morgellons disease where they looked at the lesions on the skin and they evaluated it. And what they found was agrobacterium. Now, agrobacterium is used in creating genetically engineered crops. Oh, really? So this was like hmm. a red flag raised saying that maybe this was developed from some kind of experimental GMO that was grown in certain regions because Morgellons seems to be regionally affected. And, of course, if that's the case, they'll do their best to cover it up and pretend it's not related to GMOs or even pretending that it doesn't exist. So many of us are concerned about animals. What about your pets? How do we know when you go to the pet store to buy your dog or cat, whatever you feed them, that you they're know, not getting GMO-type foods. There's a rather famous veterinarian named Michael Fox who's written 40 books and writes a syndicated column that goes to 12 million. And I interviewed him recently, and he just wrote a blog, which we're about to post at responsibletechnology.org probably next week. And he said that when GMOs were introduced into the food supply for humans, the pets, were the recipients of the byproducts of the human food chain. So the only change for the pets was the introduction of GMOs. And he said he saw a rise in a nexus of diseases, including allergies, asthma, um, uh, atopic dermatitis, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel, colitis, diarrhea, vomiting, indigestion, and abnormalities of liver, pancreas, and immune system functions. These are the kind of things we're seeing in laboratory animals and also on the rise in humans. So when he, he doesn't have his own practice now, but he gets letters from hundreds and hundreds of people who say my dog is, or cat is itching and all this. So he tells them switch to organic food, and they write back saying, the problems have disappeared. Tell me about genetically engineered mosquitoes. <laughs> it sounds stranger than fiction. It does. You know, they released them uh, last year in the Cayman Islands in Brazil and Malaysia. You know, it's a supposedly a very benign and beneficial uh, intention to fight dengue fever and eventually malaria by creating sterile male non-biting mosquitoes that mate with the biting females and produce sterile or dead offspring are sterile so they basically wipe out mosquito populations through genetic engineering well first of all you're genetically engineering something which doesn't necessarily always produce sterile offspring when you look at their studies three percent survive and they're planning to introduce millions upon millions so three percent is huge which means you may get bitten by an offspring of a genetically engineered mosquito that has never been tested for human safety. Oh. And then they find that in the presence of tetracycline, which is prominent in, in parts of the environment, then up to 15% of the offspring will survive. And it could breed, right? And yes. who knows what the offspring will be like. Exactly. In other words, we're, we're irreparably changing the gene pool of a mosquito that draws blood that's known to carry diseases. <laughs> And it's like, do you want to do the recall on that, George? I don't. <laughs> no, n not at all. So what else are they engineering? This is like the, the island of Dr. Moreau. It's worse than that. I mean, they have a, a salmon that grows 
uh, twice as fast as regular salmon that they want to introduce. It's a frankenfish. When they put that in tanks, when they put a different type of salmon that was very similar in tanks with other fish but reduced the amount of food, the frankenfish freaked and started eating other salmon and, and cannibalizing, and there was a complete population crash or extinction. And these they want to they want to put into our food supply. They want pigs that are called enviral pigs that produce less, supposedly less, less toxic manure because they want to keep their confined animal feeding operations and just genetically engineer the pigs so that they fit into this horrible industrial model. Essentially, what they want to do is genetically engineer, according to Monsanto's own um, former consultant, Arthur Anderson, 100% of all commercial seeds in the world and patent them. And so there are hundreds of varieties of GM crops that are in some level of production, and if we don't stop it, we could they could be replacing nature. This is probably one of the biggest stories I've ever heard that is really going unreported in the mainstream media. Oh, yeah. I mean, what, what's happening in the, in the mainstream media is completely ridiculous. In fact, I wrote a story about Dr. Arpad Pustai in my book, Seeds of Deception, which, by the way, I'm doing a special gift for your listeners. I've never done this before. If they go to our site, responsibletechnology.org, they get the free first chapter download of Seeds of Deception. And in this in this uh, story, I talk about Dr. Arpad Pustai, who was commissioned to discover how to, how to test for the safety of GMOs. And he discovered that they were absolutely a disaster for health. And when he was able to, to go public, he went public with his concerns, was a hero for two days, and then, then two phone calls from the U.K. Prime Minister's office basically ended up resulting in being fired and gagged and threatened and, and defamed. When his gag order was released, it, the, there was a complete firestorm of coverage throughout Europe, over 700 articles within a month just in the U.K. alone. But Project Censor described that as one of the ten most underreported events of the year in the United States. So it was covered dramatically in, the, in, in Europe, but hardly a peep here. Around the same time I was what, reading Time Magazine, the international edition had uh, stories about GMOs, the U.S. edition, nothing. Can we win? Yes. How? That's, all right, here's a couple of scenarios. Scenario one, in November, Californians will have the opportunity to vote for mandatory labeling of genetically modified foods. On everything. On every food that's sold in grocery That has it. So if it's in a can of soup, it's got to say that. Exactly. This is the way you can find out if your can of soup has GMOs more easily than having to read the ingredients. Now, most Americans, 53%, say they would avoid GMOs if they were labeled. So what do you think Kraft Food and Nestle's and Hershey's are going to do if they have to put the label on? They're going to remove GMOs rather than admit that they're using them. So all of the national brands that are sold in California will remove GMOs, and we will have basically a clean-out because the same companies that already removed GMOs in Europe will realize they don't want to tell Americans that they're eating GMOs. So, but when, when they clean this out, what are they going to go back to? The well, Mother they, Nature type foods? Yeah, they'll go to non-GMO. There'll they'll be enough seeds, you know, within a couple of growing seasons to, to produce the non-GMO. And they'll come rapidly coming back, won't they? Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, you can buy plenty. I mean, there are thousands of products that are non-GMO verified at this point. When you, when you buy a packet of seeds from a company for your garden, mm -hmm. what are you getting? Non-GMO right. or GMO seeds? Well, first of all, there's very few genetically modified crops that or, or plants that you would actually grow in a garden. That's so true. The only ones you have to worry about are zucchini, yellow squash, corn, and if you happen to be in Hawaii... Papaya. Papaya, okay. Those so the, the tomatoes are okay? Yeah. Right. However, there's news that just came out that oh. maybe China is growing genetically modified tomatoes. I'm, I'm going to do an investigation to verify that. If that's the case, then it's a game ch changer for what to eat in the United States because we import a lot of stuff from China. Yeah, that's a good point. But, all right, so in California, in November, they're going to vote on this. I, is it a referendum or is it, uh, it's will a it be law? It's a ballot initiative. It's like one of those measures. Okay, measures. so if it passes, it's law. It'll pass. Well, the thing is this. Here's How could it lose? The reason it might lose is this. There was a similar vote in Oregon in 2002, and about 70% of the people were in favor of labeling. That was when it started. But by the time the vote came, 70% of the people voted against it. Why? 
There was a disinformation campaign highly funded by Monsanto and the biotech industry lying. It told the people it would cost every, every uh, family about $555 per year if they voted for it. It's complete nonsense. It's just adding a label. It has nothing to do with, with increasing costs, but they got away with lying. They also created all these front groups saying it was bad for farming and it was you know mothers and stuff. It was a complete whitewash. Now, if they are facing the possible removal of GMOs from food around the United States because of this vote, how much money, George, do you think they're going to put up in a disinformation campaign? Huge money. Right. So we're in a situation right now where we need help in California in order to make this happen. We need money, and we need uh, volunteers to help gather the petitions starting in about a week. So if you go to labelgmos.org, you can get involved with either as a donor or as a as a petition gatherer and in responsibletechnology.org you can learn more about the whole initiative and sign up for this free newsletter and we'll let you know it will keep you updated about the whole progress of how things unfold in California. If California passes this, will this be a guideline for the rest of the nation and will other states follow suit? It's already starting that way. In Washington state they tried to introduce uh, a bill through the legislators, legislation, and it did fail, but it was the same, it was modeled after the California one. There's something that's, that's happening in Connecticut. It looks like something may be happening in Vermont, in some other states. In fact, there's more than a dozen states where there's some labeling activity going on. Plus, just, uh, yesterday, there was, or was it today, there was a, a bicameral letter from Boxerman and DeFazio asking the FDA to label GMOs, and so there's a lot of a lot of buzz around labeling now that we've never seen before. And this, I think, is the rise of the tipping point of consumer rejection, which is the other way we can get rid of GMOs. You know, from what we're discussing, and we've only scratched the surface so far in the first hour about the dangers of GMOs, and there's more we can cover. As people learn just how dangerous it is, they're going to grab our shopping guide at, at non-gmoshoppingguide.com, and they're going to avoid GMOs. And if we get about 5% of U.S. shoppers avoiding genetically engineered ingredients and brands, that should be enough to create the tipping point because it will show that GMOs are a pure marketing liability. There's no consumer benefits. No one clamors for their daily dose of Roundup or the toxic BT toxin <laughs> that kills them. It's not like your cuff of Java, is it? Exactly, exactly. All right, my friend. Jeffrey, stay with us. We're going to take phone calls with you when we come back. Don't touch your dial because up next, you're part of the program. Phone calls with Jeffrey Smith as we talk about GMO, his book, Seeds of Deception. Websites are all linked up at coasttocoastam.com for you. And like he said, he's giving away the free chap- the f- first chapter, if you want to take a look at it online, of his book, Seeds of Deception. The idea of GMO crops... Was it an idea that was well thought of initially, or did it just simply go awry? Was it bad from the get-go? Originally, when scientists realized that they could swap DNA between species, they got together in a conference and said, this is too dangerous, too risky, just just over-the-top, new, irreversible, uncontrollable, let us self-police and ban it. And then all of a sudden, Monsanto was saying, oh, we can do it safely and we can put it into food and we can get it out there. And I talked to one scientist who was, who was very familiar with genetic engineering, and she said, well, it must be that Monsanto had discovered new ways to do GMOs because we know it's so full of unpredicted side effects. They must know something we don't. But when she later realized what they were doing, it was the same unpredicted technology that had caused a lot of people to put the brakes on. And it turns out that they were able to manipulate the FDA to allow GMOs in the market without any required safety studies. It turns out the person in charge of FDA policy was Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, who later became Monsanto's vice president, who's now the U.S. food safety czar. He completely ignored the warning after warning after warning of their own scientists who said that this stuff is dangerous, unpredictable, and could cause health problems. Will it ever end, Jeffrey? Well, I think that we will see, you know, small amounts of GMOs in our, uh, in the population of these crops, perhaps forever. 
But I do think that what we're seeing is the signs of a growing tipping point. We have never seen the kind of anti-GMO sentiment spreading in the United States. We're also seeing every day new health risks that are starting to make headlines slowly, not necessarily the mainstream media. For example, I got, a, I got an article tonight. This is a very interesting and very dangerous development. It's about botulism and how botulism may be exploding in, inside guts of livestock because when the livestock eat Roundup-laden crops, the Roundup kills the controlling bacteria in their gut that controls and keeps down the population of botulism. But when they, even one-fortieth the amount of, of glyphosate or Roundup residues that are allowed on crops, just a tiny amount, can destroy the controlling bacteria. And they're seeing, there's research now in Germany, one study that's come out, another one that's about to come out, that is showing a very large explosion of this botulism, and one scientist pointed out to me that when 200 cows died last year on a Wisconsin farm, it was told they were announced that it was probably pneumonia, and so no investigation had to be done. He said that's not what pneumonia does. It was probably botulism, and it was probably a prevented investigation, not to cause an alarm. Okay, and again, getting back to pets, pet foods, what do you look for at the store? Organic at this point. I mean, I, there there may be some pet food companies that say non-GMO. Another way to do it, I talked to someone who had cats recently. She said she took she chose the cat food that had no corn in it because the corn is genetically modified and no soy in it. So you can avoid the soy and the corn, for example, and that'll help. Or you can buy the organic, and some may actually say non-GMO for your pets. What symptoms do your pets come down with if they're ingesting too much GMO? Well, there's a whole list of symptoms, as I read earlier. But the one thing that the veterinarian told me was uh, itching, allergies, and all that. In fact, if we look at other animals, I was talking to a livestock veterinarian. He said that when GMOs were introduced a whole new syndrome of diseases that came out that were much more virulent and much more difficult to treat, but that when livestock switch to non-GM, it takes less medicine to get a response, and you don't have as many sick animals. He, and I've also heard from one other veterinarian, he said that the whole gut bacteria completely gets destroyed and, and distorted, and we're seeing that a lot. And we expect that to be happening in humans. In fact, the only human feeding study ever published showed that the genes inserted into crops can take up residence inside the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines and may continue to produce these genetically modified proteins inside of us. Now, the scariest thing that people walk away with from my lectures is the concept that if they eat a corn chip that's designed to produce a, it's insect-killing pesticide, Ugh. the gene might transfer to the gut bacteria and turn it into a living pesticide factory, continually producing this Bt toxin. And in Canada last year, they found in 93% of pregnant women tested and in 80% of their unborn fetuses, this Bt toxin circulating in their blood. Amazing. And this is very dangerous. Amazing. All right, let's take some calls. And then I want to ask you, Jeffrey, if originally it was made, of course, as uh, also an insecticide fighter, uh, if it blows up the guts of a bug, what will it do to a human? Absolutely. You know, this is this is really of concern. When I talked to two different scientists, one who was a, I was, he was a biophysicist, MD, and master of public health, he said that he thinks that the BT toxin, which does this killing, is is probably the responsible for the autism that we're seeing. And another another scientist said the same thing. Another person who gives lectures to families of autistic you know, of autistic children, she thinks that this B T insecticidal toxin is also linked to autism. And if it's linked to the permeability in the gut, that can be linked to a whole host of things like autoimmune disease, allergies, and developmental problems. Frightening. Okay, to the phones we go, let's pick it up by going to Deanna in Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a question. Uh, Paul Stamets uh, did a uh, talk on TED, and he talked about the ways that mushrooms can save the world. He created a bag that they used and laid down in areas where there was runoff from corporate farms, and, and it was 
toxifying the making toxic the waterways and, and the ground. He found that the mushroom bags he created was able to actually change the pH, eat up those toxins, and cle- cleanse the earth. And also, he did a study where it cleansed um, toxins and diesel oil and fuels out of dirt so that the ground became lush and wonderful again and was healthy. My question is, will any of those solutions help to cleanse and detoxify from the Roundup Ready and the GMO problems that we're having? Hmm. Excellent question. I've talked to Paul, and he doesn't know of any um, fungus that can do what you're saying, but both of us are hoping that we discover it soon. Now, there's a lot to clean up. When you, when you spray with Roundup, uh, even though Monsanto illegally claimed that it was biodegradable and got fined in two different continents, it can last for years and years in the soil and cause problems year after year as new crops are planted. Uh, the BT, which is produced even in the roots, can bind with clay and last for months or years. And there's also the Roundup that destroys some of the beneficial microorganisms and promotes soil, uh, soil-borne pathogens which are increasing more than 40 different plant diseases in the United States to epidemic proportions in some cases. So the entire soil biosphere is being negatively impacted by GMOs, and we're going to need this kind of bioremediation, whether it's fungus and mushrooms or positive bacteria that is being used all over the country right now for general soil remediation, and we have to do the studies to find out its effects on GMOs. Next up, we go to Rusty in Boyle Springs, South Carolina, east of the Rockies. Hey, Rusty, go ahead. Hey, what's going on, George? Good to hear you. Mr. Smith, I love what you guys are doing. Uh, I support you guys 100%. Great. Um, Go ahead. I I just had a quick, two two very quick questions. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, what about, uh, I heard you touch on the subject of organics. Uh, what about the organics uh, if I buy it at the grocery store? If, do they contain GMOs? And the second part of the quick question was, is there any way to detoxify your system? Great. So first of all, with organic standards, you, they are not allowed to intentionally use GMOs. Uh, and I don't suspect cheating, you know, among among organic companies. They get inspected, etc. However, there is no guarantee that there's not some level of contamination. Now, there's a new system called the Non-GMO Project, which is another seal or another verification program, and sometimes you'll see Non-GMO Project plus organic, and that means that if, if it has that seal on it, it's not only organic, but it's been tested and verified that if there is any level of contamination, it's quite low. And you may see that non-GMO project seal even on non-organic products. Again, it's been tested if there's any at-risk ingredients, and the whole production system has been vetted. So um, organic has always been a trusted oasis for those of us looking for, non- for non-GMO products, and if there's any contamination, it'll be tiny. As far as detoxing, I spoke to a, a pediatrician uh, last year who's been seeing a lot of problems in children who she, that she thinks it's related to GMOs in general and probably this BT corn in particular. And she says that it takes a very complicated and complex set of treatments to, to bring people around, but she's getting it uh, when, it, when it's a very severe set of symptoms. Now, I, it's hard to know exactly what the problem is with GMOs and what's not because there's not enough studies. But if you look at animal studies, there was a study with rats that were fed, no, mice that were fed genetically modified soy for eight months, and they had changes in the testicles, pancreas, and liver. And they took some of those same mice and put them on non-GM soy diets for a month, and a lot of the problems reversed. So that does show a reversibility, which is good news. Okay, very good. Mark is in Bakersfield, California. Go ahead, Mark. You're on with Jeffrey Smith. Yeah, I had a pretty much the same question is, uh, was about the organic, uh, stores, uh, but that pretty much was answered. So my other question would be, uh, we have a pet, our pet dog is just literally has just torn his stomach 
up from itching and scratching. He's been to the vet, and they cannot figure out why he's doing this. And I, so I'm, what I'm going to do is probably just go to an organic, organic food. But my concern is all those cows that are eating this uh, GMO feed, they must be in horrendous pain. They have to hurt, you know, uh, with uh, their stomachs being eaten up and the uh, holes eating through their stomachs and their, uh, I just can only imagine that they're in all kinds of pain. You know, I mean, that gives a whole new term to holy cow, but uh, I, I just, uh, and then they're selling the stuff in the stores as well. Anybody can buy Roundup. You don't have to have a license. You don't have to, you can just buy the stuff and spray it and don't, you don't know what you're doing with this stuff. I mean, it's, you can contaminate all kinds of things. You're absolutely right. And in fact, um, when we talk to veterinarians, there's so many stories. I've spoken to about 600 farmers in three talks so far this year, and I've got two more talks in the next two weeks. Um, they're telling me these horrendous stories. One one person that has a 5,000 head cattle feeding operation, when they're eating on GMO grains, they get pneumonia, they get a joint type of infection. There was I, I, I sometimes show pictures of pig stomachs and show the, the stomachs that were of the pigs that were fed GMO versus non-GMO. Those that were fed GMO have this inflammation and ulcers compared to not. Well, some of the most weird things is that <clears throat> the, uh, the animals that have been fed GMO, when you cut them open, according to those that do, it absolutely stinks. The whole microflora is changed, at the, and the actual organs are discolored. Completely different smell and look of the animals that are fed GMOs versus non-GMOs. And if you do find, by the way, that your animal st stops getting itching from that, uh, let us know over at responsibletechnology.org. In fact, we're, we're getting our, our film done. We have, even have a matching grant from Natural News right now to, to raise the money to get the film done. Uh, maybe you can even videotape your animal itching and then if you videotape your animal eating the organic and videotaping any results and talking about it. If it happens, we might be able to use it if it's done quickly because we want to get this film done quickly. Good point. Now, olive oil, that's okay? Olive oil is great. One problem with olive oil is that, uh, this is an interesting fact, George, there is more olive oil sold in the world than grown. So what that means is they're cutting it with canola. However, it's often done that way in, in Italy and other places, um, and there the there the canola would not be genetically engineered. So in general, olive oil is a good alternative, and this is important when you go out to eat because a lot of a lot of restaurants will use vegetable oil, which is usually soybean oil. But you can say, do you have pure olive oil there that you can cook my food in? And that's how I get around traveling 180 days a year, eating in restaurants all the time, but staying non-GMO. What kind of sugar if people are going to use? Sugar that you I recommend. Well, pure cane sugar, for sure, over regular sugar, but definitely not the sugar substitutes like aspartame. Aspartame comes from genetically engineered bacteria or microorganisms, and there was 93 different categories of symptoms in the complaints made to the FDA about aspartame, including brain tumors, seizures, and blindness. If you Google aspartame symptoms, you can camp out for days, and you will get rid of your habit of aspartame during, during that time. Next up, let's go to our first-time caller, Matt, truck driving in Oklahoma. Go ahead, Matt. I just want to know, uh, we, as far as they've already got stuff in place of uh, gardening, let's like do the fact that uh, they got biodynamics. So they've proven over in Australia how they cleaned up their earth and made it work. They're, they don't have a runoff of their uh, soil and... It helped their plants, uh, uh, not their plants, their, their cows and everything. So I just want to know, if, uh, his name was Rudolf Steiner. Uh, just want to know, if, you know, if anybody heard about it as far as that. Have you heard about this, Jeffrey? Oh, yeah. Biodynamics is very popular around the world. They have a lot of very good results, a, a very interesting system. In fact, what's happening now is there's – systems way beyond organic that really bring nutrient-dense um, materials, nutrient-dense foods, um, biological remediation, the biodynamics, 
it's all there's a lot of knowledge out there and it's not being supported by our government and I understand why because the industrial agricultural model basically runs roughshod over the US government so right now there's a 30 year study by Rodale where organically grown soy and corn has the same yield as the GMO and conventional, but less inputs and more income to farmers. And in developing countries, organic and sustainable can double yields. And these are huge studies with 12 million farms. And then if you add things like permaculture and biodynamic, it can even get better. So there, we have enough food in the world um, right now, enough to feed 11.3 billion people. So this feed the world argument is false. GMOs reduce average yield compared to, to normal seeds. And we have systems that can produce healthy food for everyone. What are the odds that the steak you eat was from uh, a cattle that uh, ate GMO corn? Well, it's around 100%. Oh. <laughs> the thing is, what's the, where you can find non-GM is this. If it said 100% grass-fed, then you only the only risk there is alfalfa. And the other one is if it's organic, it is not allowed to be fed genetically modified grains. But if it's just called natural or but that no, doesn't say that on your on your package of steak does it if you, there's, you can sometimes get organic but it's not common it's a little it's more expensive because to get the non-gm grain into the animal you got to buy a lot of grain or you got to grass feed them they've got us coming and going it's true in the united states especially when going out to eat if you're a meat eater it's very hard to avoid animals that have been eating gmos and according to the Center for Veterinary Medicine of the Food and Drug Administration, they wrote back in 1991 and 92 that there was a serious, unique health risk associated with GM feed that could affect humans through meat and milk. What do people do if they want to act like California, Jeffrey, and get some kind of initiative on the ballot? Well, not every state allows for ballot initiatives. Colorado has it. Washington has it. Uh, so you have to, first of all, find out if your state has the ability to do a ballot initiative. And then you'll probably want to get in touch with us <laughs> because you don't want to just create one and not have the money to support it. That would be a problem because then what happens is you're just inviting a huge, expensive disinformation campaign, as happened in Oregon, and people end up going backwards because now the population thinks that GMOs are needed to feed the world, that they're healthy and safe, and that it would cost a lot of money to, to label it. And so you, if you don't organize well and raise money well, it's not worth doing it in the first place. However, there's a lot of legislative efforts with bills going back and forth for labeling GMOs, labeling GM, genetically engineered fish, labeling the milk from bovine growth hormone, which is a genetically modified drug. These are still going around. And, I'm in fact, I'm doing a press conference in Hartford very soon about that. Okay, let's go back to the phone calls. Let's go to David Truck Driving in Washington, and he is up with us on Coast to Coast. Go ahead, David. Hey, how you doing? Good. Great show. Um, my question is, with all these genetically modified foods, and quite a number of the population can't really afford to care which foods they're eating, can it be used as a conduit to genetically modified people? in specific ways and if that's true could should we just be all growing our own food I mean, you know indoors under a light or something when you say david a conduit for genetically modified people i'm not sure what you mean i know that when you eat gmos it's possible in theory for it to reprogram your dna we know that from a study that came out recently where they fed rna from rice to humans and it reprogrammed their liver and the way that it worked with cholesterol so we know that theoretically a gmo because it produces new newfangled rna might reprogram uh human dna we also know that the genes might transfer and probably do transfer to the gut bacteria living inside our intestines that was found to, to have occurred and that they might continue to function uh and we do suspect that it's reprogramming our health and causing a dramatic increase in a whole host of disorders. In fact, irritable bowel syndrome went up 40% since about the time GMOs were introduced in the United States. As far as genetically yeah, engineering, noticed, yeah? Go ahead. I've Dave. noticed a lot of people getting uh, a lot of this acid reflux, too, and it seems to be uh, a lot of folks just eating genetically modified foods that I've noticed on your list. Stuff. I never realized it, but I quit that, and... I don't get heartburn as much anymore. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a whole host of gastrointestinal problems 
were be were directly resulting from eating GMOs. I talked to one top scientist in the world, Dr. Arpad Pustai, who's featured in that free first chapter of Seeds of Deception on our site at responsibletechnology.org. And what he says is that he believes that the digestive system would be the first uh, and most important place to look for disruptions. And it's very interesting. I've speak to some people that butcher animals, and they say, with the livestock in the U.S., when you pull out the intestine, it just breaks apart like paper. You can't use it as sausage casings. They have to import sausage casings from New Zealand because there's just completely trashed inside intestines in the livestock in the U.S., and they think the GMOs is probably the cause of that. Jeffrey, how long have you been doing this, and what got you interested in this? Well, I started in 1996, and I went to a lecture from a molecular biologist who was describing the science of how GMOs are completely not ready for prime time, how there were all sorts of changes that you could never predict and actually never evaluate, and, and that just that year they were about to plant genetically modified seeds throughout my state of Iowa and put it into my food supply. Now, the science was so compelling, but it was science, and a lot of people don't relate to science. So I have a background in education and communication, and so I just started immediately taking his words and interviewing him and translating it into language that everyone could understand, and I haven't stopped. I ended up putting out Seeds of Deception in 2003. When it became the world's best-selling book on GMOs, I was sent to 25 countries, and as I was giving this book, which is more stories about scientists who were fired, stripped of responsibilities, forced out, hijacked regulatory agencies, you know, all the, all the dark underbelly of GMOs, when I would give that to, you know, members of cabinets in different countries, I realized they don't have time to read a book that's a storybook. So I wrote another book called Genetic Roulette, which is basically an easy-to-scan reference of all the different health dangers of GMOs, and that's being used around the world for decision makers. And then I realized, well, there's visual learners, so I had to create movies, and now I'm creating a movie about all of these doctors. So basically, I get propelled into this because I see that we have just a simple way to stop GMOs, and that's to inform people of the dangers and provide them with ways to avoid GMOs in their lives, and that will create the tipping point. How many people are like you out there, Jeffrey, who are well, you know spending their time and efforts to get, the, get this fit? There's not a lot of us, and we have different agendas when we're working against GMOs. Uh, great organizations like the Center for Food Safety work to contain GMOs to try and prevent the introduction of new GM crops, whereas the Institute for Responsible Technology, our organization, works to eliminate everything by a tipping point or a labeling uh, initiative, something like that, so that the existing GMOs go away and no future GMOs will be introduced because there's simply no market for it. Anson, Queens, New York, it's your turn. Hi, Anson. Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you doing? Good. Good. I just want to add another spin to this. Sure. Um, well, basically, I've been reading reports over the past couple of months that um, organic food, what's to say it's organic? First of all, I mean, we have to do our research in terms of uh, finding out what's uh, healthy for us. and Basically, everything that we consume, we have to do research on, basically. True. That's true. How, can, how, point, how can we trust these people, Jeffrey, that, well, that with they're organic, organic? With organic, there is a third-party verification system. All organic places are inspected. There's documentation. You can't guard against outright fraud. And so that may take place in some cases. I have concerns about that some of the Chinese organics coming in. And when I went to China, I did a little investigation, and people assured me that if it's a government organic investigator or certifier, it's probably good. And if it's not, you don't know. But who knows? Who what, knows? Yeah, exactly. Look, out of the, I don't know. Out of, not out of China with all that lead poisoning we've seen over the last couple of years and all that stuff. Yeah, now we find that they may be secretly growing genetically modified tomatoes and sweet peppers, and I have to verify that. So that's a little nerve-wracking. Um, I haven't heard much reports at all of organic fraud in the United States, just a little bit here and there, but, but uh, very little. I think it's, a, it's a, a community that has a lot of their heart in the right place and a good system for verification. They don't require testing of GMOs, uh, so the verification process is not – it wasn't designed with GMOs in mind, and I think that they should probably add that to the standard.
All right, Anson, you have another question. Yeah, Go ahead. I also wanted to say that um, here in America, we've been taking a very proactive approach following suits of other nations, what's going on around the world. And I just want to give a quick example, like in Bolivia, uh, three months ago when uh, President Morales wants to build that bridge, that land bridge, mm -hmm. the uh, citizens of Bolivia stood up day and night protesting, peaceful protest, and they, they got it overturned. President Morales said, you know, he's not going to bother to do it. But it was because of the people's efforts day and night. And what I'm saying is that we have to become more socially and more hands-on active, take a more hands-on active approach instead of depending more on Facebook. Because basically my, my thinking is that, you know, something happens, we post on Facebook, we post on Twitter. We do, we do that and we get a feeling of, of satis satisfaction that we've done something. No, I, I look at the model, what they did in Bolivia, as a perfect example. Peaceful protest day and night until you get the results that you need and want. Well, that's true. Of course, had they done that in Syria, they all would have been shot to death, Jeffrey. Well, here's what I think about this. A very, very thoughtful comment. Uh, first of all, if your goal is to try and convince the government that they need to change, then simple click and send is not necessarily going to do it. If you're trying to convince people to change their behavior, a lot of people get information off the Internet, and I think that you can have a social media revolution that can turn GMOs into a marketing liability. So, for example, if you go to responsibletechnology.org and you sign up for our free electronic newsletter and send it to everyone you know, that we know for sure that our materials, that the videos that we have online posted for free, change people's behavior. They don't have to go outside. They don't have to do silent protests. If they watch this video called Everything You Have to Know About Dangerous Genetically Modified Foods. It changes people's diets on the spot, and we know that because we've tested it. So it depends on your strategy, and I think that if you're looking for behavior change, you can do it from an online community perspective. If you're looking for changes in the government, they need to see more these days than simply a petition. I drink a lot of powdered green juices, and the labels in the back, it says organic certified so what's that mean there's four ways that organic can be listed on a product and they mean different things if the organic is on the front and it says either a hundred percent organic or organic or made with organic ingredients or made with organic greens then no GMOs are allowed to be used in the entire formulation now, you can have different percentage of products that are not organic in there. So, like, if something says made with organic ingredients, 30% can be non-organic, but none of that 30% is allowed to be GMOs. However, if you don't see organic on the front and you just see it in the ingredient panel... On the that back. It's for, ...that it's for one ingredient, it just says, let's say, organic uh, greens, but there's soy lecithin in there, that soy lecithin can be genetically engineered, or the or the dextrose can come from genetically engineered corn. So if you just see the word organic within the labeling panel and nowhere else, it doesn't tell you about the other ingredients, just the one that is organic. Good point. All right, next up, let's go to Los Angeles. Hey, Andrew, welcome to the program. Hi, George. Uh, great show. And, Jeffrey, thanks for uh, standing up uh, and uh, doing your very best to help wake up America to this agenda for depopulation. You know, what gets me is the fact that uh, it appears as though what's happening is not an accident. There is definitely agenda. The mere fact that they put the uh, former head of Monsanto as the FDA commissioner, to me it says it all. They want to kill off as many of us as they can, and not just limited to the U.S., but around the world. My question to you is, do you think that uh, – oh, by the way, did you know that uh, at the Monsanto cafeteria, I understand that the uh, employees there demanded non-GMO food? I don't know if you heard about that. Yes, I, I write about that in Seeds of Deception. It was interesting. It was the cafeteria in England in 1999 where the, a letter from the 
a restaurant owner, in response to an inquiry, said, uh, due to concerns raised by our customers, we removed <laughs> GMOs. Now, I also learned from an insider that, that when they traveled to a different location, they, they were arranged for organic food to go there so they didn't have to eat GMOs. I found out that the White House, under the Obama administration and Bush administration, used pure organic. And another insider from Monsanto, a former scientist, said that three of his colleagues we're doing studies on the milk from cows treated with Monsanto's genetically engineered hormone and that they saw so much of the cancer-risking hormone IGF-1 in the milk. These three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. So they're not ah. willing to eat the stuff that their company is producing. I mean, organic food will be the food for the elitists, huh? Indeed. <laughs> My question to you is real quickly, uh, do you know uh, if there is a connection between Monsanto buying Blackwater, uh, the, the offshoot of Black, Blackwater, or do you think that's uh, strictly a coincidence? Mm -hmm. All right, I don't think they bought the offshoot of Blackwater. I think they contracted with a division for doing intelligence as well as infiltration of groups that were against GMOs and for those uh, animal rights groups. This was reported. Uh, so. Also, you mentioned earlier the former head of Monsanto is the FDA commissioner. It's almost right. The former vice president of Monsanto is the U.S. food safety czar in the Obama administration, and he was formerly at the FDA as the person who allowed GMOs on the market without any safety studies whatsoever, without any labeling. And it turns out the Obama administration has been worse than the Bush administration in terms of GMO promotion. One of the things about the Internet is that these stories run rampant, and sometimes they're inaccurate, Jeffrey. I know, and I spend a lot of time correcting all the time. And I know when I, get, when I publish stuff, it goes out to millions of people, and so I do a lot of fact-checking, and I hate when I discover occasionally a mistake because then I have to go out there. But usually we're pretty accurate, at least with the current information. All right, next up, let's take another call or two. We'll go to Oahu, Nebraska. Les is with us. Go ahead, Les. Yeah, thanks for taking my call. Sure thing. Here, 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 here to that last caller. Um, anyway, uh, I used to work at the Cargill plant here in Nebraska uh, for about seven years uh, in the construction department, just digging footings for the buildings and stuff they're putting up. And uh, we got contracted to uh, um, haul away it was either two or three million bushels of corn that were in their large elevators that the trucks that would, would come in in, a, in high volume. And somehow, some way, some corn that was contaminated with some kind of special GMO corn in Iowa had made it into the bin, and they didn't know which load. So, so we had to haul all of it away to a landfill, and it had to be covered with dirt by that evening. They didn't want any animals or birds getting into it, and it was not made for human consumption. And the first time I had heard about anything like that, I, I was at a barber shop, and I read a popular mechanics magazine, and it said they had uh, uh, scorpion DNA mixed with corn ah. for some reason. It's just like, God, what are these guys doing? And this is like back in the late uh, 90s or early early 2000 when this happened. And, I, you know, I've, I've read more and heard more. The Internet's got all this information. You guys providing this information. I just wish that we can get this to the mainstream media and people to realize how serious this is. First of all, I've got to tell you, I totally want that information. I want every, every detail you can remember about it. Please contact me at responsibletechnology.org. It turns out at, at late 90s and, and 2000, there was a lot of incidences of farmers saying that their cows and pigs were getting sterile from certain varieties of genetically modified corn. And some truck, truckers actually brought it to a Cargill plant. I don't know if it's the one you were working at, but, uh, and it was supposedly milled into the human food supply. But uh, they, there was also at the, uh, around the same time an experimental corn that was genetically engineered to produce a spermicide. So some people were speculating that maybe the spermicidal corn got contaminated with the feed corn for the animals, uh, but we don't know because we've never been able to, to find it and test it. So there's a lot of – and right now we're discovering a whole new organism associated with Roundup crops, which might be as, have associated with it. So we, it's an unsolved problem, but it happened on, on several farms in Iowa, and I visited the farmers. And every time it was reported in the paper, more and more farmers would call and say, I'm having the same problem. Jeez, it never ends, does it? 
It's amazing. Jeffrey, get your websites out for us, please, and tell us about that little free offer. Sure. If you go to responsibletechnology.org, right in the blog section on the top, you can you can download a free chapter of Seeds of Deception. I've never done this before. It's only on for a few days for Coast to Coast listeners in celebration of tonight. And then up in the upper right-hand corner, if you would like to donate to get our film out quicker, Mike Adams of Natural News will match that donation. So that's responsibletechnology.org. And you can also sign up for a free newsletter.